Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Bronx Library Center. My name is Jean Hartmason, and I'm the managing librarian here. It is so nice to see all of you here on a Friday night to celebrate reading and the books that shape us. One question we always like to lead with at the library is, who here has a library card? Raise your hand if you do. Good. If your hand isn't up, I encourage you to visit the table outside following the program, and we'll get you signed up. If you do not have proof of your address with you, just come back during regular business hours. If this is your first visit to the Bronx Library Center, I just want to let you know that you are sitting in New York City's first municipal green building. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The Bronx Library Center is the largest public library in the Bronx, and it features a vast array of educational programs and reading and research materials on this level and on the five floors above. We're open Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and on Sundays from 12 noon to 6 p.m. We encourage you to come back after today and explore the many free resources we have to offer for all ages. Tonight, we're honored to open up the space in partnership with the National Book Foundation and the New York Department of Cultural Affairs to bring you notes from a reading life. This is our third event in a series of four conversations featuring neighborhood heroes such as Desus Nis and cultural commentators and icons like Rebecca Carroll. Talking about the books they love the most, one thing I'd like to share is Desus is more than a neighborhood hero. As a former employee of the New York Public Library in the Bronx, yes, his family here. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you were able to pick up a copy of one of Desus's favorite books, George S. Schuller's Black No More, on your way in. We'll be hosting a book discussion here at the Bronx Library Center on August 29th. The details are in your program. I hope that you will read or reread the book and join us to continue the conversation then. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Lisa Lucas, Executive Director of the National Book Foundation. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and a huge thanks to everybody at the Bronx Library for hosting our series. Um, so we came up with this idea um, because we try to get people to read all the time. And we're always taking our National Book Award authors around and getting people to come and read their books and hear what they have to talk about. But we're not ever bringing people who are not writers, necessarily, as their first career, um, out to see audiences and talking about what they are reading. And sometimes those are the best recommendations. Um, so this series was really about bringing people who are known readers, but not necessarily known writers, to talk to communities all throughout the New York Public Library system about what they are reading. And we hope that you will not only check out the book that we gave away today, but also the rest of the books on the list, because they're all really, 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 really good. Um, so this is the third in the series. The first one, we've hosted Studio Museum's Thelma Golden and Caitlin Green and Carlum, um, Project Runway's Tim Gunn, and National Book Award finalist Min Jin Lee in Greenwich Village. And tonight, we are honored and delighted that Desus Nice is here to continue this series and that WNYC's Rebecca Carroll will facilitate the conversation. Um, they're going to have a chat, and then we'll give you guys a chance to ask questions. Um, if you do have a question, we are recording tonight, so please raise your hand and we'll bring a mic over to you. 
Um, and then next week, we will have our final um, notes from the reading life, and that'll be in Staten Island. It'll be Alex Gildari and Alexandra Kleeman, who are actually both writers, but they both live in Staten Island, and we thought that would be a cool way to end it. Um, so just really quickly, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the National Book Foundation. Um, our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, to expand its audience, and to ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. Um, the way that most people know us is through the National Book Awards. Does everybody know what the National Book Awards are? Yeah? Hands? Yay! That makes me really happy. I have definitely stood in front of groups where people are like, not sure. <laughs> and you're like, super self-explanatory. Um, but anyway, we've been around since 1950, and we've celebrated great literature with honorees including William Carlos Williams, Ralph Ellison, Rachel Carson, Adrian Rich, Lydia Davis, John Edgar Wideman, Jesmyn Ward, ta Coates, Colson Whitehead. Um, but our work goes beyond just awarding great work. We do a variety of educational programs. Um, yesterday, we were on the Lower East Side giving away 16,000 books to kids in New York City public housing, and... 422,000 books will go out around the country to 37 different communities in 19 states. Um, and we do a whole host of other things. Check us out, nationalbook.org. Um, I'd like to thank the New York Public Library in general, including staff members Faye Rosenfeld, Emily Krell, Alex Kelly, and Raylan Rogan for partnering with us on this new series. We hope we get to do it again and again. Um, and thanks to DCA for supporting the program. And now I'll start introductions and shut up, since you are not here to hear me talk. Um, I am delighted to introduce your moderator for this evening, Rebecca Carroll, who is a cultural critic and editor of special projects at WNYC New York Public Radio, where she develops, produces, and hosts a broad array of multi-platform content, including podcasts, live events, and on-air broadcasts. Rebecca is also a critic at large for the Los Angeles Times and a regular columnist at Shondaland and at Gothamist. She's the author of several interview-based books about race and blackness in America, including the award-winning Sugar in the Raw, and her personal essays, cultural commentary, and opinion pieces have been published widely. I also enjoy her very much on Twitter. Um, and our special guest for tonight is Desus Nice. He goes by many names. And this is my favorite part of my remarks because I get to say his many names. Desus Vice, Young Chipotle, Jermaine Avocado Toast, Young P.A., The Ghost of Mufasa, Desus Ex Machina, and that's just a few. I'm sure he'll tell you some more. The writer, comedian, and podcaster rose to prominence alongside fellow Bronx native The Kid Miro. When the former, school, when the former schoolmates reconnected on Twitter, they were both amassing a growing following based on their 140 character complaints covering their mutual dissatisfaction for their jobs. Lots of syllables in this bio. Desus was writing dry articles on things like tax codes for a magazine targeted to black entrepreneurs, and Miro was slogging through a job as a teacher's aide at a public middle school, mixed with pointed and funny pop culture commentary. That social media momentum ultimately led to their web video series for Complex Magazine, Desus versus Miro, and then caught the eye of executives at MTV who cast the pair in a number of projects. Their current hit podcast, The Bodega Boys, followed, and now in its second season, their critically acclaimed late night show, Desus and Miro on Viceland. Um, and I have been following him, and he's been following me on Twitter since like 2009. And this is the first time we've ever met in real life. So I am personally very excited to welcome Desus Nice and Rebecca Carroll to the stage. Hello, Test. hello. Wow. I know you all came out for me, right? This feels so naughty being in the library after hours. Like, oh. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about reading and books and the wondrous things about them. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking uh, about reading and how it has such a bad rap for a lot of kids. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of black kids, mm -hmm. right? Um, and th that I discovered reading was not just about a sort of proper education, but about making your mind bigger. Right. When did that first happen for you or uh, occur to you? About making my mind bigger through yeah. reading? Well, as a kid, uh, shout out to my mother. She used to be the senior librarian for Soundview Library. So 
ever since I was a baby, every week, my mother would read me the New York Times. And like, to increase my vocabulary. And she'd always take us, she'd take me and my four siblings to the library almost every day. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> she read the New York Times to you? Like, yes, there's pictures front of Front page, arts and leisure, read, weddings. Read everything. There used to be a routine in our family on Sunday, you'd fight over which section you would get. That's a beautiful thing. That's how we used to do it. That's I thought, a beautiful I thing. I assumed everyone's family did that. I, and <laughs> I started reading people, I was like, you don't read? Ugh, ugh. <laughs> And what was your favorite section? My favorite section, uh, I really like the styles section. Yeah. Also the wedding section, because yes. you could judge the couples. It was yeah, like, it, totally. If, Isn't that the only reason that's anybody the only reason. ever yes, looked just at like, the, you two the, are the vows? Yeah. yeah. Or you see the one photo and it's just the bride and not the groom, and you're like, mm. Yeah, I know. What's going on there? Or, of course, when they were together, like the eyes set up like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also the library in my neighborhood, shout out to the Edenwall branch, that was our local library. It was just a magical place because it also, it was safe, because my neighborhood at the time in the Bronx was really bad. But when you went to the library, it was just like, kind of like, I guess when you play freeze tag, you have base. Like, no one would mess with you at the library. So you can go there after school, and you just stay there from four to six. You can read any magazines you want, get on the internet, just read books, and just be transported from your bad neighborhood. You don't have to be outside. young enough to have been on the internet when he was a child. Yes. And now feel... No, it was... Whoa, whoa. It wasn't like the high-speed <laughs> internet. <laughs> it was like, you asked the library, can I get my five sheets of paper? Okay, I'm printing. It's gonna take me all day to print out something. But <laughs> and did you have boys or people or friends who who were also at the library with What's you? What's funny is all my friends hung out in front of the library, but didn't go in. So I would always just be like, "Yo, I'm going." So they're like, "Why are you going inside?" I was like, "They got like books and stuff." They're like, Pfft. "Yeah, books." But I, it's, for some people, the library isn't cool at all. But if you see what the library can do and you really utilize the resources of it, it's like a cool place to hang out. Now, I know you picked books uh, that were your favorites, but do you remember a, a book from your childhood that was like, bam? Oh, there's so many. There was the Goosebump series. There was like the Choose Your Own Adventure, and the, you kind of turn the page, and then you turn to page 38, like, oh, no, not that one. <laughs> there were all those series. Um, I was, well, my thing as a kid, I would become obsessed with one topic and try to take out every book in the library on that one topic. And then I learned that you could take out up to 30 books. Wow. A lot of people don't know that. I'm, I'm giving out <laughs> secrets now. But you could take out every book. Like, I would be obsessed with robots. And my parents would be like, all right, take out every book you want on robots. But you have to bring them back. So any, it wasn't necessarily a series. It's just like, today I'm on UFOs. Tomorrow I'm on goats. Tomorrow I'm on robots. God, just, I loved UFOs when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting And as a kid, you know, you see UFOs all the time as a kid. Right. You, <laughs> that's so true. Like, there's like five of them right there. That's like, those are planes. But... <laughs> So I'm trying to think of little Deesis. Uh, so you'd go to the library, you take up 30 books? 30 books. And how'd you carry them home? I had a bike, and it was like, it seemed like Leave it to Beaver, but the black version, it was a lot going on. The backpack, or? I was just like carrying them under my box, like under my arm and stuff, in a box or something. You know, just trying. And then you'd get home and just put them on? Just go into my room and just like sit there and read them. Wow. Yeah, which, uh, which annoyed my father. Weird enough, I don't know. But I was like seven, so if, if a Jamaican seven, you should have a full job by then. So <laughs> he felt I was just wasting people's time. But and so when did you? Um, I mean, reading for me was was laborious until I discovered Maya Angelou. Mm. You know, I mean, I was growing up in a in a very white town and um, adopted into a white family, and so all of the books were like, you know, um, Call of the Wild yes. and you know, Grapes of Wrath and uh. this and that. It was just so. Uh. But then <laughs> I discovered Maya Angelou, and then Toni Morrison, and then Alice Walker, and I was, and and James Baldwin right. and Richard Wright, and just I felt anointed. I, it was just so magical. But so, did, was there ever a period for you that it felt like work? Uh, yes, for early on, in, uh, we went to, I was in a program called EG, Exceptionally Gifted. I was there with Christopher Hayes and all these other kids. There's been so many names for those programs. Yes. Right. This one was very hardcore. We were reading The Catcher of Rye in second grade. Okay. I read Black Boy in fourth grade. Wow. So now imagine okay. a young black male in New York City, you read Black Boy. And Catcher in the Rye. You know what? I, okay, second grade, I had no idea what was going on there. I was like... Holden Caulfield, he's in like a ride, he's catching stuff. It's like, I don't know what this is. But Brady Black Everybody's Boy. a damn phony. And I remember my, shout out to my good friend, Cicero Sam and his mother, because they were like, you can pick what books you want the kids to read in this group. And it was the four black kids in this gifted program. You know, we're the only four kids in this program, even though it's in a black school. And Cicero's mother picked Black Boy. 
And we read that. And after that, it was like, Psh. I was like, I was like I, they're doing this in the South? And they're like, yo, it's still going, there's like racism going on. And just, it opened my eyes to a whole lifestyle that I did not know existed. I didn't know about like segregation and slavery because I was like in fourth grade. And then it's just like, off of that, I just read more Richard Wright, more Richard Wright, just devoured everything he had. So I sort of worry sometimes about exposing those kinds of books to my kid, mm -hmm. and he's not four, he's 12, um, because I'm not sure how to help him reconcile with that. Right. So how, what, you were in the fourth grade when you read it, and did you feel frightened? You know what, it was kind of a, this isn't, this, it was a weird thing because going to a gifted program, but this sounds funny, I did not realize race. I didn't realize Chris Hayes was white until maybe eighth grade. <laughs> like, what his, like, I swear to you, his mother came in and I was just like, oh wow, your mother's white. And he's like, yeah, I'm white. And I was like. <laughs> I was like, the betrayal? <laughs> but no, at such an early age, it seemed like fiction. It seemed like a, another, it might as well have been a Star Wars movie. It seemed like something taking place in another galaxy. Like something, I, I was just like, I was just like, wow, people go through this, people live this, not realizing that eventually at some point in my life, I would have to go through some of the things that he was writing about. But you're like nine years old. You're like nine years old, but I mean, I got stopped and frisked at 11. So, I mean, there's, there's parallels that it kind of prepared. Like, you start seeing things differently, especially my neighborhood at the time was really, our interactions with the cops were never good. So it was kind of just like, the way the white people in this book, Black Boy, are talking to Richard Wright is very similar to the way NYPD tells us to get off corners. And so gears start clicking in your head, you're like, what's going on here? What's the history behind this? Why are these so similar? And so after Black Boy, in, instead of sort of being like, okay, I don't want to get into that, and you, you know, I want to push that aside, you, you went in deeper in, in yeah. reading about race. Oh, much deeper. Uh, more Harlem Renaissance books, much more Richard. I just, something about the way he wrote, I just really connected with it. And can you, how many times have you read it? If I could bring you my copy of Black Boy, I still have the same copy from fourth grade. It's falling apart. It has like duct tape on the spine, but I have like all these annotations in it and things. And like looking back, the annotations I did at like 13 are different than the annotations that right. I do at 22 and 25. So I still have it, it's still, it's still there. I should buy a new, like even this, this copy of Black and White. I didn't know what this was because this is the new cover. I got the, yeah. I got the troll book order cover. Like. Yeah. No, I mean, I was thinking about that in terms of, um, of that book specifically, Black No More um, by George Schuyler, um, the premise of which is th this black man becomes white or has the opportunity in, in this new kind of um, um, not study. Is it a study or a... It's like a program or like, yeah. something similar like that. But I wondered if your reading of it the first time has changed... It, it, in the course of, of, of getting older or evolving because the premise of him wanting to be white was that he was rejected by a white woman. Right, see I didn't get that the first time I read it. I read this as sci-fi. I was just like, wow, they're yeah. turning races. Like, it yeah. seemed like, a, like I did not pick on the racial context of it. I was just like, yo, they're turning black people white. This is wild. <laughs> like I thought of like a Jack Jerry Bruckheimer movie, you know, just big special effects. And so, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. So, but no, now, so look, now, going back, I'm just like, wow, not only is it like, it's super deep, and just the level of satire on it, because some people read it and took it as face value, like, he, this is something he wanted. And it's just like, no, it's kind of playing on the idea of, like, it kind of, like, jumped ahead of the idea of fake news, the idea of Donald Trump. And you know, like, you hear things, it's just like, oh, this certain, Hillary Clinton killed 30 children. And you put that on Facebook and people believe it, and there's no proof of it. And on this, there were just like whispers of black people are turning white. And then in the book, they kind of turn on each other and white people are just like, are you really white or are you turned white? And so like that whole idea of like the other and being afraid of each other, like mm -hmm. they kind of spoke on that way before it happened. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think you make an interesting point too about people reading satire at, at face value, but I think when it's a black author, mm -hmm. there's more at stake. Right. Um, and so, you know, I don't read a ton of satire, um, but I appreciate it. But this one in particular, which I've not read, I've, I've skimmed, um, and I know sort of the plot-ish. But I, I, I wonder if there is a danger, specifically now, say, if somebody, um, a young black man, reads this book. A uh, danger in that they'll try to come up with the Well, danger or? in that way. <laughs> There's that. Because uh, I think Vibes Cartel that did that already. That would be dangerous. Who? <laughs> 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 I mean, no, the, uh, the sense of nuance in America is kind of gone. It's right. not as, so like, that's satire what I'm, that's wouldn't what go I mean, over as well. That's what I mean, is that in this particular era and, and climate, it's like, 
you know, Paul Beatty or somebody, yeah. you know, or Spike, who has Spike Lee, who's who's tried to get at some of that as well. And and it it's it's harder, I think. The stakes are higher. Yeah, that happens a lot with my Twitter feed because a lot of my tweets are super sarcastic, and. Because I have more followers now than I used to have. Like I used to have more insular followers that they know me in real life, so they get the jokes, they know my sense of humor. I did a joke the other day, a guy in Staten Island, he took down a picture of Robert De Niro and smashed the picture and threw it in the garbage. This really what, happened? This really happened, there's a okay. video of it. And I said, my tweet was, it's over for Robert De Niro, he'll never work again. <laughs> I've spent the last two days, but people in my mentions talking about, what do you think Robert De Niro's not gonna work? Do you see his resume? <laughs> Are you, are, you, are you out of your mind? This, why would you tweet this? So some people don't get satire, some people don't get the jokes, but you gotta keep going. You gotta keep going. You gotta going. keep going. So I, I don't know if people um, know what the, what the five books were that you chose, but they are Black No More by George Schuyler, mm -hmm. So Sad Today by Melissa Broder, What Would Mac Machiavelli Do by Stanley, B Stanley Bing, mm -hmm. Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Black Boy by Richard Wright. Yes. So I would love for you to tell me and tell us what each of these books says about you. Okay, let me see, I'm trying to remember off the top. Well, Black Boy off the rip, Black. Um, <laughs> boy. <laughs> point right there. So Sad Today was just such an interesting book because I've always followed Melissa on Twitter. I did before I even knew who ran the So Sad Today Twitter account, and it's just like really dark tweets about, oh, I woke up today, so sad about that. Like, just really... My life of, is over. Yeah, just kind of really dark, depressing tweets, but there's something about those tweets that people on Twitter gravitate towards them. There's, it's kind of just like, you don't necessarily want to die, but there's one of the tweets was something, uh, my phone just died, so jealous. That's such a dark and disturbing tweet. And if you were to tweet that out yourself, your friends would be like, oh, are you okay? But you could retweet this. And be like, aha, this account is funny. So, but her, her Twitter, her book is actually more about those tweets, what's behind them, and her own personal journey through depression and mental health, which is something, you know, like we have a big problem with that. And not just the black community, just humans in general. You know, I just lost my friend Anthony Bourdain for that, you know? Like, fam, like suicide and depression is, running rampant right now. So just to have a book like that to read another person's views on like mental health and stuff. And it's not, it's not kind of candy coated. It's like she's very real and very frank about her own personal faults and like what she's done wrong and things like that. So it's refreshing to read. But what does it tell us about you? Um, I mean, we all struggle with our own little mental things. We have our own insecurities, our anxieties. Like I could be on stage in front of 4,000 people and it's just like, I'll see one person in the front row like this. I don't care about the rest of those 4,000 people. Yeah. It was like, I have to make this one girl laugh. And it happened the other day at one of our shows, and the girl did not laugh for the whole show. And at the end of the show, I just was in the back. This is tight. <laughs> because it's just like everyone else laughed. And it's just like, why would you come and not laugh? And it's like, <laughs> she maybe like, really? she was there with a friend. or what, But even like little things like that get to you. And then you meet other celebrities on bigger levels, and you find out they have like these little insecurities and things. And it's just like... Especially being in, not so much Hollywood, but just being, have, being in the public eye, you have to watch your mental health because it's just like, you don't know, like, people, y'all can see me on the street, y'all know me, I don't know you. And that's something you gotta deal with. Like, I'll be on the street, like, tight, I can't find my Uber, I'm fucking cursing. And someone's like, I love the show, and I'm just like, what the f hey, what's up? How you doing? Hey, no more show late now, you know what it is, ah. So, you know, it's a balance, it's a tight rope you have to walk. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, what would Machiavelli do? Okay, that's a special shout out to Lisa Lucas because I was told when I'm picking my books, I can't pick any Bronx books, which means I can't pick the 48 Laws of Power, <laughs> Coldest Winter Ever. <laughs> I can't pick Push by Sapphire. You know what it is. That's going on? Nothing but 50 Cent. But um, no, like there's certain books, there's hood books. There's certain books that if, you know, you go to your homeboy's house and he has like a bookcase and it's made from a cinder block and wood, <laughs> that's what you're gonna see. I actually lost a very good friend because he stole my copy of 48 Laws of Power, <laughs> which I'm not sure what chapter told him to do that, but no, I'll see you. But um, What Would Machiavelli Do was actually written by Stanley Bing, which is a pseudonym for a Forbes writer. And it's a, satir it's a satirical take on the art of war. No, it's a, of Machiavelli's book, yes. But they use examples from celebrities' lives 
as proof of they followed a Machiavellian way to get to the success that they have. And I wish I had the book here because there's a great chapter about Trump. And he, he describes Trump exactly to a T, but the book was written in like 2001. And the way he describes Trump is exactly the way he's running his presidency right now. And it talks about just the levels of just big thinking these celebrities had. Like Martha Stewart, they asked her what she wanted, and she was like, I want to own Christmas. Like, I just want a day off. Like that, you, <laughs> she's thinking really big. And these people, like er, from early on in their careers, they knew. They were just, Oprah was like, I'm going to be Oprah. Before anyone had a concept of what Oprah was, Oprah knew she was going to be Oprah. It was like, I, an example, Kanye. Like Kanye knew he was going to be huge even before he was even signed to things. So the book kind of, it's like, it's kind of like the white people's uh, art of war. And so um, you, you mentioned, you know, Oprah knew she was going to be Oprah, and then also just this heightened sense of people knowing who you are and how that affects the way that you um, uh, hold yourself in right. public. How do you, um, I mean, is, does reading play a part for you in terms of staying grounded, staying sane, not thinking a lot about yourself in comparison to other people? Yeah, I think more people in Hollywood need to read, just to be, you know, because that's a good way for you to... There's a, there's a lot of celebrities. We don't have to name names, but there's a lot of celebrities you like, and you're we just like, damn, could you just read a book, Let's my brother? Yeah. And it's just like, it's a way for you to get outside your own experience, to just read about other people's lifestyle, how they live, what they deal with on a day-to-day -day existence. When you're in like Hollywood, you're just going in and out of SUVs. You have like green rooms where people are catering to your every need. Like, you're not gonna know about the regular working person's existence, or you might be so far removed from it, you forgot how much it is to go down the Metro card. You know what I mean? Like little things like that. So reading, not only that, that allows you to like, you could read about like a little Guatemalan girl or an experience you'll never have a chance to experience, but now that becomes a part of your shared experience because you read this person's book. Yeah, and I think also it's not just about reading the kind of flip or opposite of what you are, mm -hmm. but something that is as valuable as you are. You know, it's, it's that whole idea of, and of course I'm speaking as a parent here, but like, you have it so good, you can't imagine what it, you know, but that doesn't really work so well. Right. Um, whereas if you just say, here's another experience that's valuable, and you will absorb it whether you know you're absorbing it or not right. through reading. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that gets lost in translation a lot of the time is that reading feels like this chore or this labor or you're supposed to get something right. from it. But in fact, it's actually happening as you're reading. Have, you, have you read books um, that you thought you were supposed to read and, and thought you didn't get anything from it and then years later you're like, damn. Funny enough, I'm an English major. So I read a lot of books that's just like, don't clap, don't clap for that. Don't clap for that. Well, my mother was like, "Just it's a fallback degree." I was like, "I was like, no, it actually worked out pretty well." But being an English major, I had to read a lot of books that a lot of times I just put my hand up, like, "Why is this considered a classic?" Yeah. A lot of you know, I did a whole course on Jane Austen, and I was just like, which was cool because I was the only black male in that. I went to college at Mount Saint Vincent. Shout out to Mount Saint Vincent. The English studies department of it was 24 white females. We would always move the desk and sit in a circle, which oh, was very... Course. Also, they would always be like... I Why do we love circles? Yeah. <laughs> it would, and I'd run in them between class, and like their boyfriends would be like, who's that? They're like, oh, it's just Jesus. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a guy too. Like, Man, what was the question? The question. <laughs> oh, about books, books that... that you, yeah. Yes, books. Every now and then there's a book that's a chore. A lot of like... I remember, what was that? Um, what's the book with the savage? Guy Fry... Um, Harder, oh, Harder Darkness, that's a whole different book. But Harder Darkness was definitely the first time I stood up in class and was like, why are we reading this? And I was like, there was another black person. I was like, you're not getting in on this? Like, I was like this, I was like, and I asked the professor, I was like, read this out loud. I was like, right now, read this out loud and tell me you're not comfortable. And the professor was like, oh, he was like, here's an A, just stop it. But certain books, like you'll read them and you're just like, what, why am I reading? Am I reading this because people tell me I have to read this? Anytime a book is forced on you, immediately you're gonna be like, ah, like no, I don't want to read this. It should be something you want to do. It shouldn't feel like, like, like cardio, like something you have to do. You know? Yes, I agree. But what I'm saying also is there have been so many books that mm -hmm. you know you should read, right? And you're reading them, and it's just like this is killing me. But then, like five, ten years later, you're like, that is so interesting. Like Grapes of Wrath, which I swear to God. 
was the most painful experience, right. <laughs> reading experience. But I feel like I would n probably not have thought about that westward kind of deal with these white folks and their caravans mm -hmm. and their starving children. I went to a little John Steinbeck groove for a little yeah. while there. Uh, Race of Wrath was an easy read the first time I read it because I realized if you skipped every other chapter, you didn't have to read about cornfields. <laughs> I was just like, yo, is he just describing wheat field for four pages? What is this? <laughs> But going back and rereading it, and just hearing about the Dust Bowl and all, like, and yeah. it's it's actually a well written book. You, it's like I think it, the problem like, is he did all right, Steinbeck. Yeah, that Steinbeck guy, check him out. He got some good stuff. But I think the problem was that it was forced to me by a school teacher, and I think I they were just like, you have to read this by Wednesday. So now, if someone gives you a deadline to read a book, you're not gonna read. You're flying and through it and then write something it, right. about it. And like right, I'm right. just like, uh, they go to the California. Someone breastfeeds someone at the end. Okay, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Tyson. Something tells me you've met him. He was on our show. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson, a yeah. lot of fun. Big guy, smart as hell. He's very smart. So he went to what, Bronx High School uh, Science? Uncomfortably smart. Way too smart. Yeah. Like, you can't hang out with him smart. No, like, he'll get drunk and ruin a movie for you. <laughs> and, like, you'll, you'll say things around Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's like, that's not, that's not physically possible. Just not like, real, was, exactly. It was a phrase, Neil. Yeah, can we just but, roll with it? Yeah. But I, what I really liked about that book, he broke things down. Like, it's called For People in a Hurry. And you just think about the things that he's talking about. He breaks them down to such an easily digestible level. And then there's something about the fact that he's also from the Bronx. So I'm just like, here's another Bronx person talking about, like, high-level science. Like, it's mind-blowing. And, like, not even the fact that I've met him, but I have just imagined, like, a younger Jesus reading this. It's like... Oh wow! I could do this instead of like trying to be a rapper or something. Like I could. But do you feel it? Because I I have not read this, but but astrophysicism and physics and all science and that sort of thing was I was just never very good at. Like right. it never I never I wasn't I felt like I felt stupid that I couldn't understand or mm -hmm. absorb it. And so then that brings into question the, the kinds of genres that we read and what what it what it says about our capacity and what you know we kind of are led to believe says about our intelligence right so in terms of genre are there are there genres that you stay away from are there ones that you feel you take on just to challenge yourself are there ones that you are more drawn to that make you feel smarter interesting interesting uh my <laughs> that was about, that was my little thinking thing um <laughs> No, my sad, my sad realization that I have to tell you guys right now, most of the books I've read in the last 20 years have been like computer manuals. I mean, hardcore like programming, like MySQL, PHP, those O'Reilly books. Like I don't read normal books. I just read like technical guides and teach myself programming languages to stay smart. But- um, To stay smart in what context? Uh, just to challenge your brain and just to be able to structure new pro uh, programming abilities, new, learn new functions, variables, things like that. And so do you then use those skills? Well, I don't have a job where I do that anymore. Right, so. But I used to, but uh, no, it's just about challenging yourself, knowing what's out there in the market. For some reason, because probably because my parents came here floating from a door from Jamaica, I don't assume this Hollywood thing is gonna work out, so I always have like a backup thing in case I have to, Listen, I might be back in the library. I might just be checking out the books like, yo. Got the barcode, like. But, but it, it does speak to this idea of what we read to and what makes our, us feel like our brains are getting yes. bigger, right? Well, that's another thing my mother taught me. She always told us to challenge your brain, just not become old and just sit there and not do anything. She would always do Sudoku, the New York Times crossword puzzle in pen. Whoa. E that's easy, hardcore, easy right? with yeah. the flex lady. Like. Yeah, right. But it was just always like, because um, you know, we've had older people in the family, you kind of watch them kind of, you know, they're not as sharp as they used to be. That was always my mother's big fear. So she was always like, always challenge your brain, always keep reading stuff, make sure the book you read, the next book is like a higher level than the book you were just reading now. Like my mother used to get sit really upset with my sisters for just reading um, Sweet Valley High. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> it, was, it, was a very, it was a very popular <laughs> book. But the reading level of it, my mother was just like, you have to push yourself. You have to read something more. You have to keep going harder. Read more academic books, more college-level books. And my sister was really like that, except for my older sister, who is the super overachiever, who just recently graduated from like medical school and law school at the same time while having a baby. But Talk I'm about on TV. I can't even outflex her. I was like, I was like, you need to slow down. You make the rest of us look bad. But okay, so 
let's go to the next book, the last book, Black Boy, which, uh, wait, wait, which you already said, what it says about you. Mm -hmm. Did you say what it says about you? I just said Black Boy, but it was just like, <laughs> it was just such a, I think because it's such a full book. It's like a full lifespan. You follow him from a child to being an adult, and he goes from like rural to south to like, now he's in Chicago. And you actually watch this character develop, and yes, it's Richard Wright, but it's called Black Boy. It could be any Black Boy. Like, it's just like, there's so many things he goes through that... You could, I could kind of relate to it, and it's like a similar situation. So to read the book and just like, no, you're just like, oh, I went through that, or damn, this is kind of similar to that. That's why that book always resonated with me, and it was just like maybe the first real adult book I ever read. So it's always gonna have a special place in my heart. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you just said that you mostly read um, um, computer programming. You got to give us something else. You, I mean, like novels. Oh, novels. novels okay, I've read. Uh, I, could, I read a lot of nonfiction. I recently just read it. I was gonna use it tonight. It hasn't been published yet. Crystal Fleming. She just wrote How to Be Less Stupid About Race, which is a great book about like um, when Obama was president, the campaign, just racism in America. Uh, my good friend Michael Arsenal just wrote a book about not dating. Can't I can't, can't date, date Jesus. Jesus, which is just a. He's a wonderful writer. He really is. He's yep. like that kind of stuff. I I read, and that's not even my wheelhouse. Like I tend not to read. I try to when I read. It's lately it's become very functional. It's like I'm reading this to learn about this. I'm reading this to learn about this programming language. So then to read stuff and it's just kind of like. I'm not reading this for any purpose other than just to read it for enjoyment. And where do, what, where do you read? Where do you like to read? Trains. Planes, uh, train. Trains, I still trains. take the train. Don't listen. <laughs> Which is weird. People get mad at me for being on the train. People are like, "Why are you on the train?" I was like, "Cause it, it's like two seventy five. Like, <laughs> it's not rich." Trains. Uh, a lot. Of t I have a lot of time in cars, so you can read in cars and stuff. Hmm? You don't get car sick reading in cars. No, no. I used to have a job where I flew back and forth to England, so I'd be on plane for eight hours. So. I can well, the plane, it. yeah, but somehow, some in the car, somehow. I oh no, like I'm good. Just, yeah. I just did a four-hour drive from Chicago to St. Louis. Read the whole time. Read, it was literally nothing else to do. It's I-99. You could either die of a tornado or just sit. And how do you feel about um, book clubs? I sort of hate them because I like my reading experience to be monogamous. Yeah. Do you feel like if someone said, "Hey, Jesus, let's all read this book and then talk about it," that's too much pressure. That's it, because now you have to all... That was another thing I always struggled with in school was um, if I felt something in a book represented something and someone else didn't, now nah, we're going to war. Right, that's what I'm saying. And it was, uh, what's the name? What's that Lord of the Flies? Oh, that's another one of them. My sixth grade teacher and me, we went to war for three months <laughs> about Lord of the Flies, about what the flowers symbolize, and if this character was a Christ figure and all this stuff. And I was like, you didn't write the book. You don't know these things. <laughs> And that was like my first real English moment, like, no. Like, it was one of those things I could have just let pass. And I was like, no, you're not gonna tell the class that this is what this symbolizes, you don't know that. And I, for some reason, I felt very passionately about this. So this is the thing about reading, right? Yeah. It makes your brain bigger in ways you don't even know. I was like, I don't care about these kids. And I'm like, that's not what Piggy's glasses meant. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, um, what's your position on books to movies? Books to movies? <sighs> If it's well done, but how... I, how often, right? How often is it well done? And there's so much nuance in the book that you can't show in a movie. And it's also the little things that make a book, like the little, like maybe a sentence about candles flickering. You can't really represent that and what that means on the screen. So you lose a lot in the translation. And also a lot of the books that get transferred to films aren't necessarily... The films are more important, more... They're more focused on, like, box office sales and actually telling the tale. So it always kind of hurts your heart when you find out one of your favorite books is like going to a movie. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be terrible. I know. There, I, I can think of two uh, that I think did the job, and one was To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay. And one was One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. That's good ones. But in the time since those, which were I think in the 70s or mm -hmm. 60s, even 70s, um, I, I feel like it's a little bit heartbreaking. Yeah. My promise to you, I'm going to be the person to bring coldest winter ever to the theaters. Well, see then. The streets need it. I've been working on this since I was like 20. Well, then, then you're going to adapt it. Because there is also something very appealing, right? Yes. Because to that point of being passionate and having your experience with that book and then taking that, your experience, and fleshing it out in a different yes. medium. And just making it available to everybody. Yeah. One of my favorite library experiences, we got an email, and it was just saying that Coldest Winter Ever and Pushed by Sapphire were the most stolen materials we had. <laughs> so we had to keep it behind the circulation desk. I was like, yeah. <laughs>
Do you, what do you find yourself doing more, recommending books or reading books that have been recommended? Oh, reading books that were recommended because I don't get out there as much as I want to as far as the reading world. There's so many good books right now. And then like every now and then I look on Lisa's Twitter page. She's like, I'm reading these eight books today. And I was like, ow, <laughs> where do you get the time? So it's like people tell me, they're like, pick this up, pick this up. And generally it's like, I don't have time to pick it up, but you just keep the name of a book in your head. And then like maybe you're at the airport and you just pick it up and you just read it like on a plane or something. And are you able to read more than one book at a time? No. Yeah, no. No, no. It's like monogamous, like you yes, said. Exactly. You gotta, I'm not out here book swinging. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. So if you had a message to young folks about reading and the staying power of of its of how meaningful it is, mm-hmm. what would you say? I, I mean, other than okay, reading is fundamental, it's kinda like wash. Nah, read, first of all, read and appreciate your library because you might not have money to travel, but a book is always going to be free and a book will allow you to go places that you don't have to pay for and have experiences that you couldn't do on your own. And just to learn to fall in love with reading because the more you love reading, the easier it is, the more you'll read. If you look at reading as like eating vegetables or a chore, you're not going to like it. But if reading becomes something like you want to get home and read, like it becomes the way you de-stress, something that becomes a part of your lifestyle for like good, you're not just reading like tax documents. It will help your life. It will help you, you'll go far. I'm the kind of reader who actually internalizes some of the passages and quotes mm-hmm. and things. Are there, are there books or passages that have stayed with you or that you think of in, in various um, instances? Well, there was one, pa- I wish I had the copy of Black Boy. There's just a breakdown he does of just superstitions that people believed in, and it was one of them was, um, if you take the hair from the tail of a horse and put it in a jar of urine, it turns into a snake. Which, someone said that's something, that's a down south thing? Is, yeah, no? You could just nod, I'll believe it, I don't know. <laughs> but it's just like little little sayings like that in Black Boy. Every now and then, it's every now and then I'll randomly hear someone say something like that, and I'm like, that okay, all right. It just takes you, flashes you right back, and you're just in that chapter right there. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to open it up to questions. All right. You ready? Come There's on microphones through. on Come the on side. Through. We got said. microphones. Yep. Hey. You. <laughs> I've been like following your stuff for like years. It's crazy. I'm talking to you. Me and my friend actually lives in Detroit. We will talk about your podcast and your show constantly. Hey. It's my breath of bond. She's actually Trinidadian. I'm Mexican. So we're hey. kind of a own deeds and marrow, but slightly <laughs> different. <laughs> Um, uh, my um, question uh, for you would be um, if you could have dinner with any author who, or a meal with any of your favorite authors who would it be oh that's a good question especially because I don't really eat but um, if you get chopped cheese with any of your favorite with, authors who would it be chopped cheese with my favorite authors let me see that's a good I should have thought about that before huh Oh, Roxanne okay. Gay, of course. Right. Roxanne well, Gay is good. Yeah, you just just met her. Yeah. Does it have to be living? Does it have to be living? I mean, Richard Wright. Yeah. It could be sci-fi. Right. Richard Wright, yeah. Because yeah. you know what? Richard Wright, like, I was a big fan of him. And then, like, as I went to college and started reading his stuff more, it's, like, very problematic towards the end. Yeah. It's kind of like Nas. He was just like, yo, it was cool in the beginning. And I was just like, <laughs> like, all right. So I definitely ask him some questions. And um, uh, Nikki Giovanni. Nikki yes, Giovanni. excellent answer. Also, Bell Hooks, I met her once. Yeah. Yes. So that was, yes. Yep. She's cool. That was pretty. She oh. wrote, she autographed my book. She was like, to the will to change, my brother. And I was like, <laughs> oh. I was like oh, I'm going to show this to every woman I ever meet. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for your podcast and stuff. Like, literally, like, I've gone through, like, and I'm sure I'm not the only one gone through, like, depression and stuff. And, like, listening to it really got me through. It got me through a final this week. Listening to you all bash about Chicago, where I'm from. Right. Cracked me up. I was like, you, our pizza's not that bad. But it cracked me up and, like, made me, like, it pushed me further. And, and for recommendations, I highly recommend, it just came out a few weeks ago, Anger is a Gift. It's about or, um, high school students dealing with police oppression in Oakland and how they organize against it. It's super powerful. It's easy to read, a lot of queer folks, and it's awesome. So okay. please consider it. Thank you. <laughs> and I thank you for using the podcast as self-help. The amount of people that write to us and it's like, you kept us from killing ourselves is just like, I mean, I get emails and people are just like, I am on the train platform right now. Your podcast came up on random, and that's the thing that kept me from jumping in front of the train. And I'm just like, okay. 
<laughs> so then it's like, if I don't want to do it on a Friday, I'm like, I better do this podcast. Like, I'm hi. My name is Sean Hudson. Hey, Sean. Hey, I'm from the Bronx, from Soundview. Hey, Soundview. Hey, how you doing? Um, real quick, I just want to say thanks for being an inspiration for making the Bronx look great again. Hey. You and Mero. Aww. And um, me, I'm an author and a poet, and I would love if I could give you a copy of yes, my book. definitely take that sure. up. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, my guy. Thanks, man. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. All right. Definitely check this out. Oh, it's printed on good paper, too, so. <laughs> Every now and then you get some book submittals, you're like, what is this? Hey, how's it going? Hey. Uh, we actually met two years ago at Art Basel with Miro and, um, and, he and um, Helen from Pulse Art Fair. Was that, wait, two years ago? Okay. 16. Awesome. <laughs> no, um, but I bring it up because uh, I think it was like the first time you guys had traveled. It was right. before Venice, right? Oh, okay. And um, what I wanted to ask is, do you prefer books or magazines when you travel? That's an excellent That's question. That's an excellent question. Uh, magazines are cool, but there's something about a magazine. You, I can read a magazine and throw it away. I can't... I've, I can never throw away a book. Like, I have books in my house I clearly need to throw away, but they're still there. There's something more. And once you read a magazine, it's kind of like one and done. It feels more disposable. It's just like, I've read this, especially on a flight. You'll read every sentence on a magazine. And then at the end of the flight, you're just like, all right, this is done. You can reread that book on another flight, or you'll find something new, or you might highlight or something. So it's like a different level. I don't even put them on the same level, like not to be catty or anything, but you know, just to, out there. Just to qualify my saying it's excellent, though, some of us are very bad flyers, and we need to have that kind of levity yeah. of a magazine to push us through. I'm not saying that is me. I just get drunk. <laughs> I, I Listen, I just get a Bloody Mary at 7 a.m., and I'm out. Hi. Hey. So I watch your show all the time, and I'm, I had no clue you read. <laughs> and so, wow. and, and so with that being said, how about like promoting that more so we know that you guys are like intelligent brothers? I love your show, but like I had no clue. She did not. <laughs> I had no I remember clue. I did. And then. Can I take a selfie? Yes. And then two, At and then the three, end. what would your rainbow say? Oh, my rainbow. Wow. Wow. All right, I've been working, the rainbow is gonna say the brand is strong, because it, it clearly is. I did, um, shout out to another round by my friend Trace and Heaven. I did their podcast, and I talked about Richard Wright on there, and one of my favorite comments was some, this girl that's been following me since 09 on Twitter was, I didn't know Jesus could read. Also, I once was on a date and I brought a girl back to my house and she was like, you have books. <laughs> this is what this kind of feels like. I, I would hope I come off as literate, but I don't, we have books on the set. There's like books right there, but this decoration. All right, we'll bring it up more. We'll do like a book of the day. All right, I don't. That's a really, that's a really good idea. I will try. I will go to the producers. I'll be like, can we do a book of the day? Like, Get the hell out of here. But. I mean, I mean, this whole conversation, right? Wouldn't you want to see something like that on the show? Well, we try to have more authors on for interviews and such, but it's generally, it's usually a timing thing. And then sometimes our guests are more about who's going to bring eyeballs to the show versus, which is something we're working you don't on. Say. But yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, when you see Erica Mena on, you know why. Yeah, yeah come on, you had to make it spicy. Uh, hello, hello, What's up, Rebecca. Man? Hello, Adizis. I hope you and Showtime can come to an understanding soon. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be spicy. I hope like they can do whatever they want over there. Uh, my question is like you guys have a lot of. <laughs> I hope uh, you guys have a lot of crazy segments. Uh, have there been segments that? Uh, a sponsor has objected to or that the censors just said they wouldn't air? Uh, no, you know, we've actually self-censored a lot of stuff. Every now and then, they'll do a video that I'm just, I don't feel comfortable showing. Like, sometimes, like, it'll just be, like, two black kids just beating the shit out of each other for no reason. It's just like, why are we showing this? Or just, 
senseless violence or early on in the beginning they used to show a lot of cop shooting videos and I was like why I was like there's nothing funny about this like there's we can't make jokes about this so that's more of the self censor like they the only time I can ever remember in our career us being censored by the TV, we were working for another channel, and at the end of the show, we shredded a Confederate flag, and we were supposed to throw it up in the air. But you guys could do the math. The network also owned like a farming network or whatever, which one of their big sponsors is John Deere, so they cut it <laughs> that we didn't use it. So shout out to MTV2. Um, what's up, man? What's up? I met you once time, or twice actually, in front of Red Bull. You gave me a bracelet. Oh, Red Bull! Yeah, I got. Yeah. You still got the bracelet? Yeah. Oh wow, I don't even have those I'm anymore. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. vintage. Don't know eBay, man. Yeah. I wish. <laughs> but I was gonna ask you, like, how do you think that, like, um, do you think that rappers are like really influential for like young like readers and like writers as well? Because like you know how like rap can be like interpreted as kind of like reading in itself. That's a good question. I remember I had an English teacher and I asked her if I could use rap songs as like um, a source for one of my papers. And she said yes. And that was just like, but she got it. She was just like, rap can be at certain points. Yo, can, can be. But Kendrick Lamar just won a Pulitzer. The Pulitzer. Yes. 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 Because on some level you have Kendrick and on the other side you got Gucci Gang, Gucci Gang, Gucci Gang, you know. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. And I think, I, sometimes I wonder, some rappers, if they read more, how much better they would be. <laughs> Just like, you see it Word. right there. It's like, not to take anything, I'm not getting my Winston Marsalis on and saying hip hop is crap. But you see it right there. They have this, they have this word play, this ability to rearrange. They're, they're poets, they're authors. And it's just like, they just need a little more source material, a little more life experience. You know, just a little a different viewpoint from what they've seen, and that would change it and maybe make the raps a little better. Because the other thing that reading does is it is a counterpoint to self-absorption mm -hmm. and self-involvement, which actually makes you less compassionate and less intellectually sophisticated. Are you trying to say our president doesn't read? Uh, <laughs> I was trying to not think about the president for a minute. But you got to get him on here. I'm listening to you, Lisa. He's like, I'm looking at the filet of fish cookbook that I'm reading right now. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, let's wrap. We've got a reception here. Uh, Jesus, what an honor and a privilege and a Thank joy. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you everybody. guys for having me.